Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today we will look at street art, plants and James Bond. Can street art be preserved? A Seattle art program shows us how. Kew Gardens in London gathers thousands of plants together in a festival. And a poll says Sean Connery is the best 007. The temporary nature of street art doesn't allow it to stick around for too long, but an art program in Seattle hopes to change that. Art Saves Me is a new home for these murals that will inevitably come down in the city. The platform was launched after the coronavirus pandemic broke out as a way to document art with historical and social significance. While most of its selection is related to COVID-19 at the moment, the website also features a section for Black Lives Matter. Well, Tyson Mitman wrote the book The Art of Defiance and he joins us now. Hi, lovely to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. So, Hi, um, thank you for having me. Preserving street art. Is it a good idea or should we just respect the fleeting nature of street art? Um, I think that preserving street art does certainly have a place, but I think that the ephemeral quality of street art is very important to the form itself. Uh, street artists realize that when they're painting something, it will intentionally be short-lived. It will have a period of time that it exists, is observed, and then will begin to deteriorate. Um, either it will be painted over by the city or whoever owns the property, by other street artists, or in the longest form, you know, a dedicated sun or the rain or just the weather will cause it to eventually just be removed. So it is subject to a short lifespan and an eventual removal. Okay, so Art Saves Me project, what do you think about it uh, in the light of what you just said? I, th I think it's a great project. I think it's a fabulous idea. And I think that it is true to the spirit of what graffiti and street art is. Um, and that is a form of self-expression that allows the individuals who are producing that art to have their voice be heard within the confines of a system that might prefer they remain quiet. And I think Art Saves Me offers a very digestible and very attractive form of that same idea of demanding um, a recognition for an idea from a population that might otherwise not want to hear it or would rather have it be ignored. Do you think that street art, public art or graffiti, uh, they stand in sort of like um, separately from other forms of art in that sense? I think that the, there is a lot of overlap between many forms of art. Um, and I think that the skill set that's required to produce street art transcends art forms. Um, but I think that the risks that street artists take and graffiti mm -hmm. artists take and that the barriers they face to produce their art is a lot higher than your standard typical artist, especially your gallery artists. They have to go out there. They have to traverse spaces that don't necessarily want them in them. And they have to risk their life and sometimes their, you know, their freedom to produce the work of art that you might see for a few weeks or even just a day. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the risks, some people voice their concerns about street artists going out to streets during COVID-19 quarantines around the world. What did you think about, you know, so many street artists coming out and doing uh, their art? Uh, you know, I think that as long as they're being diligent about the rules and are being safe and protected, that it's uh, that it's fine, that people should be allowed to express themselves in this way, and it's very hard to repress. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you recently penned a piece about street art during COVID-19. So I'm just going to ask this to you because you're, you're an expert on the topic as well. What kind of a difference do you see in the sort of street art that was produced during COVID-19? Do you find artists to be a little bit more cynical or maybe angry or just afraid? Um, I think that all of those things are expressed in the art. I think that fear, um, isolation, humor, uh, aggravation, you know, a degree of frustration with politicians are all represented in this artwork. Um, I would say that the thing that the global pandemic, that COVID-19 has done, is create a kind of univocal uh, presentation of street art and graffiti. It's given all of these artists all over the world a thing that they can communally talk about and mm -hmm. that they can produce artwork around. So it's created a kind of global dialogue 
around the COVID-19 crisis. It was univocal, but then, uh, especially when they were criticizing politicians, I think every country had uh, had something else to talk about, I guess. Why don't you talk us through all uh, the artworks that you've, you know, tackled in your piece uh, that are critical of politicians? Right. Well, I mean, I think that many different countries have uh, different politicians that have either done a great job or failed that country in different particular ways. Um, I am American, and I've seen Donald Trump fail continually in his uh, treatment of the COVID-19 crisis. And you've seen that represented in different artworks. Um, you've seen Boris Johnson lampooned a bit here in the UK. And you've seen that some of the behaviors that the citizens of all these countries and all countries all over the world have engaged in have been lampooned as well, right? This hoarding specifically of toilet roll was mm -hmm. uh, lampooned. Um, as was just hoarding in general, that was made farcical. Um, but I think one thing that has been routinely and continually produced within these COVID-19 pieces of street art is a lack of trust in the representation that the politicians have been reporting to us into the amount of risk we might be assuming just for going out into the public. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I wonder what you thought about Banksy's piece that is an homage to the NHS. Oh, I mean, that was wonderful. The NHS is a spectacular organization doing impressive work to control the virus. And they really are heroes, as Banksy has represented them. And I think that it was a wonderful gesture on his part. And I think that the piece of art being dedicated to the NHS and then also being sold to raise money for the NHS it's a spectacular contribution for him. Banksy has been, you know, sort of the, the leading voice and the leading artist in street art for years now. And I think that this contribution is just another feather in his cap. And do you think he was successful in sort of raising consciousness about, you know, health workers during the COVID-19 crisis? I think that health workers were and remain very well respected. They are treated as the individuals who are putting themselves at risk on the front lines. And I think that Banksy did a really um, impressive job of recognizing that. The thing Banksy has that no other street artist has is recognition from all aspects of the art world. His work is respected within the graffiti art and street art community, but it's also incredibly respected within the gallery art community, right? His mm -hmm. work is extremely valuable, is sought after, is clamored about. Um, and as such, as soon as he produces a piece, it gets worldwide recognition. And when he produces a piece specifically supporting uh, the NHS and promoting the heroes that they are, it is a great piece of artwork, but it's also a great piece of, um, not, propaganda is not the right word here, but a piece of celebratory information to promote the NHS as an organization for the fine work they're doing. All right, Tyson Mitchman, it was lovely talking to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. London's Royal Botanic Gardens has a multinational display for those who want to get a sense of travelling around. Plants from all around the globe are being shown in a festival. Nursena has more. They call it Travel the World. Although it's quite unlikely that you can travel the world right now, London's Kew Gardens came up with a festival that might just give you the illusion of it. Kew Gardens has more than 50,000 plants from six continents on display. And we've devised a wonderful trail of, which takes you to 10 different countries on six continents. So everywhere from the Mediterranean garden where we are now, to a Japanese tea garden, the Californian redwoods, and a South African mountain top. And you can do all of that in one day and really feel like you've had a holiday and really benefited from being out in this wonderful landscape. There's also a botanical sculpture in the shape of a humpback whale. An artistic duo used 700 plants for this work. Some of the material is recycled from English beaches. They say they try to start conversations about sustainability, 
creativity and our environment. They also say there's another reason why they decided on this artwork. We were given the brief traveling the world by queue, so essentially we decided to choose an animal that traverses the whole planet on its migration, um, yeah, on its migration route, so there's a whale. Um, also, the whale, the belly of the whale has been described as a place of metamorphosis. We've all been kind of locked down, hunkered down at the minute, so it's this whole kind of rebirth as well. Because of worldwide travel restrictions, Q is tentative and the organisers say they expect the number of visitors to decrease by half from last year, when a record of 2.3 million people showed up. For those in the UK, the seasonal display will be available until October. And for the rest of us, let us go back to our little succulents in our living rooms. Hollywood star Sean Connery couldn't have been happier. Not only did he celebrate his 90th birthday recently, but a poll declared Connery's James Bond as the best incarnation of the world-famous spy. Here's Ali John with more. Look, he's gunning for trouble. 007, it spells Bond. In a recent Radio Times poll, Sean Connery took 44% of the votes to claim the title of Best James Bond, with Pierce Brosnan and Roger Moore following behind. Connery first assumed the role of the globe-trotting British agent in 1962 with Dr. No. But then, the film received mixed reviews from critics. At the time, Bosley Crowther of the New York Times dismissed the character of Bond for being the stuff of daydreamers. But Connery's 007 became popular with the audiences. Prior to Dr. No, those working in the espionage field were mostly portrayed as hard-boiled wise guys, not unlike film noir detectives. Wait till you get to my teeth. Connery brought a suave, calm and cool quality to this old archetype. And audiences responded to this new kind of cinematic spy representation. Tiana Paluzzi, lovely to look at, murderous to know. Friends of yours, no doubt. Come in. The role became Connery's signature role and helped the Scotsman become an international movie star. He assumed the role of Bond seven times, and each of these films were blockbusting financial successes. Even in his last outing as Bond in Never Say Never Again, critics wrote Connery has lost none of his charm and is more appealing than ever as the stylish, resolute hero. Since Connery's retirement from the cinematic version of MI6, six different actors tried to fill his shoes. Good to see you, Mr. Bond. Why would I betray you? We all have our secrets. One surprise. The list of Bond favorites didn't include Daniel Craig, even though when he first took the role in 2006, he was called what fans and critics have been waiting for, a caustic, haunted reinvention of the character. You get in my way, I will put a bullet in your knee. It seems that when debating an iconic franchise lead figure, cinephiles go back to the original. Name? Bond. James Bond. The French city of Nantes is often packed with tourists this time of year. Of course, that's not the case this summer, but it hasn't stopped Nantes' annual art festival. Let's check it out. A four-poster bed floats on a canal and water cascades down the Nantes Opera House. These belong to a festival called A Journey to Nantes. The annual event goes on for two months and the director says they're working hard to stick to the plan. Although some of the installations were never finished or built, they managed to turn the city into an outdoor exhibition. 
We really did everything to maintain them, even if we had to transform, adapt, and postpone works to next year, replace them with existing works, there you go. We've deviated a little from our own rules to make this happen, and that's it. The route we're proposing this year is quite enjoyable, very playful, and very diverse. We go from one work to another, from one world to another with great ease, because we walk around. It's a walk in the city. There is no specific theme, so as not to limit the artists, but water plays a significant role. And this waterfall is a metaphor for a theater curtain. The idea was, well, one of the motivations was to take the theater out of the theater itself. That is to say that the theater architecture becomes a stage. By proposing this curtain and the square becomes an amphitheater, and the audience is then outside. There was also this desire to slightly mask the theatre and the possibility of going behind the waterfall to discover what I hope to be a treasure. A Journey to Nantes offers 62 pieces to be discovered and organizers keep some of the artworks permanently every year. So this is not just an ordinary walk in the city, but also witnessing the transformation of a historic town that was once a home to the Dukes of Brittany. As lockdowns ease over the coronavirus, Istanbul is seeing one of its first new exhibitions. The Para Museum is exploring the tradition of miniature paintings. And showcases Sena Arslan found out how this old art form is finding a new voice in the contemporary art world. <laughs> Fourteen artists from different countries such as Iran, Pakistan, India, Azerbaijan and Turkey. Forty contemporary works on miniature. Para Museum is bringing together all these in a new show called Miniature 2.0. It's supposed to be slightly different from the traditional art form and its age-old function. Miniature dates back to the 12th century and expands over a large geography from Iran, Pakistan, India to Turkey. We see examples of miniature in the West too. In the East though, miniature became a court art. It was used to document the important moments in the Sultan's life, as well as to depict famous literary texts and stories. With the arrival of press machine, the art form underwent a change and was unable to survive later. The museum says artists take miniature out of its historical context and give it an up-to-date reinterpretation. This way, says the Para Museum, miniature joins the most current discussions in contemporary art today, such as colonialism, orientalism, economic inequality and gender. Iraqi-American artist Javi Karaman's series is called How Iraqi Are You? Here, Karaman changes the stories in Makamat al-Hariri, a 13th century book mostly about men to stories about women. Turkish artist Halil Altundere's work refers to an 18th century painting. It's called Sultan's Accession to the Throne Ceremony with Drone. Altundere brings elements from the classical miniature and reflects on his Ottoman heritage. Meanwhile, Palestinian Saudi artist Dana Avartani's installation is set in a vacant house once owned by her grandparents. She covers the floors with sand, reminiscent of old Arabic houses covered in traditional Islamic tiles. And once she completes the pattern, she sweeps it up, in reference to the destruction of this cultural heritage. The keyword for all these works on display here is resistance. For every artist, resistance has different means and ways. Some create a discussion from within the norms they're opposing, while the others try finding ways to transform these norms. For instance, in Dana Awatani's work we see resistance against a perishing culture. Or Imran Qureshi's installation that we're standing right next to. He's an artist from Pakistan, where violence is a persistent issue. In this work, we're seeing the flowers blossoming out of a bloody conflict. We're seeing hope. 
I asked the curator about the work we're standing under by Imran Qureshi, perhaps one of the most striking pieces in the show. This work summarizes Miniature 2.0. You don't understand it's a miniature work at first, but when you see the exhibition completely and consider all the other works on display, you start to understand. This work is basically a wrinkled piece of paper, and paper is historically the main material of miniature. Similarly, in the video of the same artist behind you, we see a gold leaf. Gold is an important material used in traditional miniature. And we see again, the gold leaf wrinkled and destructed. It's a work that the curator says reflects the treatment of this ancient art form today. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Alexander Burganov's name is associated with the birth of surrealism in Russia. His sculptures can be found across Europe, Asia and the United States. And now the 85-year-old is taking showcase on a private tour of his Burganov house, a state-run museum in Moscow. <laughs> I was introduced to art by my father. He was a mathematician, but he probably wanted to be an artist. And that's why it all started by him. Then there were, of course, excellent teachers. For my long life, which I did not expect that God would provide me with, the main thing that I understood it is necessary to listen to that subconsciousness stream that passes through us continuously. Therefore, today I am associated with surrealism. For the first time, I was called like that by my friend Pierre Cardin. Although we can say that surrealism in Russia began with Gogol. Well, I don't stick to any rules, I just do what I like. And this is the basis of my creative routine. I think that I certainly have a happy destiny in terms of realizing creativity. I have many works in different museums, both in the West and in Russia. Thanks God, I have my workshop, the opportunity to work. And this is the most important thing. The artist creates his own alphabet, his vocabulary with which he communicates with others. I went away from copying nature, which was traditional and classical painting or art, and came to symbolic elements from which I make up the meaning of what I want to say. And among them, of course, the hand occupies a huge place. I am very often asked, what is a hand? And in my view, this hand is the face of God. When I say God, I say a creator, including an artist. And therefore, it is no coincidence that it is just a symbol of meaning and then so all-embracing that it replaces any portrait and any image of a person. Therefore, the hand personifies a human being as a whole. In my work, I have not done any bespoken work that would not meet my soulful needs. I just look inside myself and inside each person who communicates with me. I want to see those main driving forces that make up the meaning of his existence. I made a lot of portraits, and mainly people who are symbols, such as Pushkin. He is a symbol of poetry, a symbol of tragedy, a symbol of beauty. He is some kind of a symbol of Russia. I never thought that I will have a museum, but it means a lot to me. When you understand that your works do not leave the workshop, but they all gather into one natural whole, then it inspires very much. 
In the last centuries, the orientation was towards painting, but today, sculpture as a spatial volumetric body, like some magical idol, it returns again to its main place. Now, with the help of modern technology, you can just make a copy, stop the life. But I think that this is not the art of sculpture. This is the art of technology. But the art of sculpture, it is to make such an object that is not only surprises, but it helps people live and fight for good. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter pages have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfede Kitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.